Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anne Florini. I'm the director of the Center on Asia and Globalization, and it is a very great pleasure to welcome you all to this afternoon's presentation. As you saw in the flyer, we're here to talk about a rather sobering subject, the subject of global health governance. And as the flyer says, from pandemic influenza to chronic diseases and from fragile health systems in times of financial crisis to the health impacts of climate change, the world faces a staggering array of diverse and transnational threats to health and well-being. This is by no means an exaggeration. Um, Tiki and I just came from a several days at an international meeting in Italy focusing on how is it one deals with this array of problems and what are the threats to global health and well-being. And to say that it's a staggering array is very much true. So we're going to hear something about those threats today. And fortunately, we're going to hear about it from somebody who is at the center of the world's efforts to deal with these problems and can tell us exactly where we stand and where we ought to be going. Dr. Tiki Pang is a leading practitioner of global health. He's presently the director of the research policy and cooperation at the World Health Organization in Geneva. He is also, very importantly to me, the co-director of the Global Health Governance Study Group of the ST Lee Project on Global Governance, which is run out of the Center on Asia and Globalization, um, which is a really path-breaking effort to try to understand how international relations, global governance, and health intersect. That study focuses on questions of sovereignty, the nature of world order, and how we deal with the really fundamental threats to human well-being. Um, Tiki was previously professor of biomedical science at the Institute of Postgraduate Studies and Research at the University of Malaya um, in Malaysia. He has been editor-in-chief and publisher of the Asia-Pacific Journal of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology, has a very large number of publications, books, and scientific articles. And with that, let me turn it over to Tiki. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to, to come back to Singapore to see uh, such old family friends like Professor Wang Gungwu. My father was actually the dean of accountancy and business administration at the University of Singapore in the late 60s. So I, I, I know the city very well and have seen a change uh, over the many years. Always nice to come back. Um, I'm going to talk about this whole issue of global health governance. And I guess the next slide shows you, um, this sort of slide illustrates the central dilemma that I'm going to try to address. It's a situation where you have, uh, in a way, horses uh, pulling in different directions. And you can imagine these two people uh, driving the cart to be trying to control the direction in which these horses are going. And I hope to be illustrating that, that dilemma uh, as, as we move along this uh, uh, presentation. So um, perhaps it's probably a good thing to start with, with, with definitions. When we, when we say global health, you know, we're referring to an, an area of study, research, but importantly also practice. Okay? It's not just an academic exercise that places a priority on improving health and achieving equity in health for all people worldwide. It's very much sort of a, a WHO view of things, but I hope you'll bear with me on that. Importantly, it focuses on, on health issues which cross borders, okay? Uh, issues as well as, as determinants, as well as potential solutions. Um, importantly, as I'll illustrate, it is very much inter as well as multidisciplinary, and we need to deal with them, collab to collaborate beyond just the health sciences. And finally, I think sometimes, which is lost on a lot of people, it's not talking about treating individual patients, but it's also a synthesis of population-based prevention as well as treating individual clinical cases. Um, in terms of global health governance, many, many different definitions, but this probably works as well as any uh, from uh, David Fiddler which is sort of defined as the formal and informal institutions, norms and processes, which govern or directly influence global health policy and because of the policy, of course, the outcomes. So I hope that sort of sets the scene in terms of what is global health and what I mean by, by governance. Um, I'm gonna try to cover these sort of three uh, broad areas over this presentation. Firstly is to just bring you up to date with the with the current 
global health challenges, and then ask the question, um, does global health governance, the way it's currently constructed, able to deal with these challenges? And then perhaps just some personal reflections on, 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 on some recent developments and the implications for the future. I don't need to, to go to town about this one. Everybody knows about it, but I think in, 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 the, mode, in the crisis mode related to, to influenza H1N1, we forget that it's not the only threat. If you just randomly pick things in the last two or three months in this part of the world, you realize that there are other things to be concerned about, plague in China, cholera in Papua New Guinea, and the ever-present threat, for example, of dengue, which even in Singapore remains a major public health issue. Um, another very important thing that I've mentioned many times is the shift towards non-infectious diseases. And you can see just between uh, these uh, two red lines how over the years that has become much, much more important. And you're talking about cerebrovascular diseases, uh, heart disease, as well as, as cancers. And in the old days, people referred to these diseases as, as, as rich people disease. Okay, now that's a myth because 70% of these uh, mortality due to chronic diseases are now in the developing countries. I'll just give you one example, a recent study from Cape Town, and you can just look at the blue colors there in terms of this um, sort of different kinds of uh, diseases. You can see that the blue is referring to injuries as well as non-communicable disease. And in the various different provinces of South Africa, that in fact is much higher in prevalence compared to the tra traditional infectious diseases. So that's another challenge. But I think if you go beyond specific diseases, beyond whether it's infectious or, 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 or chronic, you see a, a much sort of more important set of risk factors behind it. And I just want to illustrate one of them, and that's tobacco, okay, which as you know, is the background or the determinant for many of the chronic diseases. Six million will die every year by 2010. The total cost is simply staggering, not just for medical, in terms of medical expenses. Loss of productivity, environmental harm, and in the context of this part of the world, China is the biggest producer and consumer, consuming 37% of the world's cigarettes. So it's, you know, you should look at, at global health in terms of risk factors as well. And WHO, one of our key functions is the collection and dissemination of information. We've just released these two publications. Uh, in fact, the one on the left here is, is not, not out yet, but it will be in the next few weeks. And this identified that there are five risk factors, okay, now we're going beyond diseases here, that actually cause more than a quarter of global deaths. And that's children who are born underweight, unsafe sex, use of alcohol, unsafe water and sanitation, and high blood pressure. Okay, so this places uh, in a more generic level. The World Health Statistics, which gives a global picture of the incidence and, and, of, and mortality and morbidity, tells us that progress with the Millennium Development Goals, and I'll, 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 I'll elaborate on this for those of you not familiar, has been very slow. There has been some progress with MDG4, but very poor progress with MDG5. So don't worry about those numbers, I'll explain it to you in a minute. So in this context, just to remind ourselves that this was a global compact signed up by all countries at the UN Millennium Summit in the year 2001. And the important, in a sense, directly health-related ones are MDGs 4, 5, and 6. And I said, as I said, we've, our, our information shows we've made some progress with re reducing child mortality, but not much in terms of, of uh, the health of, of women. And in a way, if you look at this slide, which in a sense tells you the percentage of the population who can access a whole spectrum of basic healthcare services. Okay, these are basic things like antenatal care, ORT when you have diarrhea, basic immunization strategies. You're not talking about anything high technology. You're talking about basic intervention, primary health care. You can see that in, uh, in, in, in many developing countries, 
uh, these 50 countries are mostly in the low and middle income groups, you find that access in some areas, in, 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 in some areas are actually still very, very low. Like for immunization, it's less than 40% and goes even lower down this end of the spectrum. What's even more worrying, this slide also tells you that if you are poor, okay, you are likely to have lower access than if you are rich. So there's a big, big equity issue here. Um, and then in this particular case, I just want to show you one other slide. The issue of uh, maternal mortality is MDG5 and it's a very, very severe problem. Now, if we were going to reach the goal of MDG5 by the year 2015, that's the cutoff date, we will need a rate of decline, which is shown in this slide, okay, to reach the target of 75% reduction in mort maternal mortality. And this is sort of uh, focused on, on the South Asian countries. Um, so you need essentially 5.4% decline per year to reach that goal by the year 2015. What's actually happening, the actual rate is closer to 1.6%. So to reach that goal, you're going to have to wait till the year 2076. Okay, so that, that illustrates to you uh, perhaps some of the challenges in this particular sector of, of healthcare in terms of reproductive and maternal health. And the background, uh, you know, those two slides that I showed you basically illustrate that many healthcare delivery systems in the developing world are in a very precarious state. And I'm not going to go into great details, but they are precarious mainly due to problems in four areas. Clearly, the first one is money, the financing of, of health systems, the actual delivery of services, getting uh, drugs, interventions to the people who need them, a huge problem with not enough people, and not just doctors, you're talking about nurses, laboratory assistants, community health workers, and importantly, information. WHO, we continue to be staggered at the number of countries around the world that do not even have vital registration of births and deaths. They don't even know what their people are dying from. Okay, so that's another sort of uh, huge issue in terms of health systems. And in terms of financing, this illustrates also the problem about how many countries are actually totally, almost totally dependent on external resources to actually run their health system. Okay, this is the latest figures from the World Health Statistics in a country like Mozambique, 60% of their national health budget comes from external donors. So if you have a financial crisis, okay, you can imagine the impact on healthcare delivery in some of these countries. So now what I want to do is maybe go a little bit beyond the health sector. And as I mentioned before, this is an issue which is increasingly becoming very, very intersectoral. And clearly, the one that is always very, very visible is climate change. And in fact, many people actually consider climate change to, to be the biggest threat to health. And this paper from 2008 basically tells you where the health impacts are going to be. And I'm j just focus on the first four there. It's likely to have in low-income countries uh, a, a health effect which is increase in malnutrition and consequent disorders including child growth and development, increase in death, disease, and injury res resulting from extreme weather events, okay, uh, like floods, storms, fire, and drought, uh, mixed effects on, on, on malaria, but overall changes in the way malaria is distributed, and also in the range of some vectors of infectious diseases. But this one here, you can see, is got very long-term consequences in terms of, of the healthcare system. If you have children who are malnourished, the longer term effect on, on development and, and health is very, very uh, significant economically. And once again, uh, it's, it's a common theme that though others started global warming, it's the developing countries mostly which will bear, bear the brunt of, of the impacts. In addition, to climate change, and, and probably related to it, and as many of you know, there are also very uh, recent concerns with water, the scarcity of water, scarcity of clean and safe water, 
and the impact of that on, on food uh, production. So in other words, food security is another part of this big scenario. And the UN Standing Committee on Nutrition published this report earlier this year, which basically says if global growth falls by 2 or 3%, perhaps related to this financial crisis, and investment in agriculture falls by 20%, what you'll see is a drop in cereal prices, like maize, for example, by 30%. And the impact of that is that 16 million more children will be malnourished globally. Okay? So it is all sort of all in, interrelated, uh, in a sense, across uh, sectors. So just to quickly summarize uh, this part of the presentation, um, I think we, we're looking at impact of globalization and financial crisis. The, the, the threats are multiple, they are diverse, there are new emerging ones like H1N1. Who would have predicted 18 months ago that you would have had this particular virus coming up? Uh, failures in del delivery and access. I'm talking about the health system failures here. The gaps and the inequities, which I've illustrated with, with uh, maternal health. And of course, the, the health systems which are unable to achieve the targets. Uh, I showed this slide at, at a meeting in Bellagio recently, which I think summarizes the whole picture nicely. Um, it was, in a sense, trying to identify the global drivers currently that's resulting in unwanted outcomes. And you can see out of these uh, seven sort of global drivers, five of them, okay, directly impact human health, like increasing antibiotic resistance, which I haven't mentioned, but many of you know, that's a huge public health problem. Increasing connectivity, and of course, you know, increasing trade, movement of people, um, rising human numbers and urbanization uh, clearly has health impacts. Uh, the potential risk with nuclear proliferation and, of course, terrorism. And, of course, these are all interrelated as well, and those are, are, are the dotted lines. So it's, it's probably a nice summary of, of how this world is now so interconnected in terms of the unwanted outcomes. Um, so let me move on now to, to discuss a little bit about global health governance. You know, can, is it in a position to, to deal with these uh, challenges? And the next slide gives you a snapshot of global health governance, okay? And basically, it's a big mess, okay? <laughs> Huge, big mess. Many, many different players, many, many new players with lots and lots of money, okay? All with good intentions, but basically completely uncoordinated and creating havoc all over the world, especially in the developing world. And I'll, that's what I'm going to elaborate on now. You can see it in the numbers, okay? The Institute of uh, Health Metrics and Evaluation showed this dramatic growth in development assistance in health in that period between 1990 and 2007. You can see how it's gone up almost exponentially to about $22 billion, and this shows you uh, the source of funding. What's more interesting is the next graph, which shows you the channel through which these fundings have been coming through. Now, traditionally, if you look in the old days, it's the good old players. You know, basically your bilateral agencies, your regional development banks, and of course the World Bank, both through the International Development Assistance as well as the uh, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. But look at how things have changed in terms of the channels above this red line. So the picture has changed a lot, okay? And there are many, many other players here. Uh, this is the Global Fund to combat H HIV, HDV, and malaria. Uh, this is BMGF. Anybody know BMGF? Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Great. Okay. And uh, international NGO and, and other foundations. So they, the, whole, the whole field has changed quite dramatically. Interestingly, more and more of the bigger developing countries are also playing a role in this. Okay, and this just shows you China, Russia, Iran, and in, in, in Venezuela have become increasing players in development aid. Well, it is, this article, if you read it, is a little bit uh, cynical, perhaps. They refer to this as authoritarian aid. Uh, let's not get into that in this presentation. But you can see that that's going to be increasingly important in the future. Now, at the same time, there have been attempts to try and guide all these efforts. The Paris Declaration 
on aid effectiveness tries to set up the principles by which we hope all these people who want to give money will play. You know, it's a sort of rules of the game, if you like. They should look at ownership. In other words, the partner countries must have a say. Alignment, not everybody, three donors doing the same thing, okay, but try to align. Harmonize, okay, that between the donors, they, they talk to each other, being transparent and have synergies. Focusing on results, and I think that's the big gap here. Many, many of these programs go into countries with never any attempt to actually evaluate, is it actually working? Okay, and then sort of, you know, related to that, of course, mutual accountability. But despite all of this, at least, you know, this in a way happened in sort of 2005, so you could argue maybe it's too soon to say, but the current thinking is that the current architecture of global health governance is simply not working. The money may be flowing, but people are still dying. And some of the problems I've referred to that essentially they're creating chaos in countries is illustrated in the next two slides. This one tells you that um, a district medical officer in, a, in Tanzania, Morogoro districts, spends 25 days in a quarter writing up reports for something like 35 agencies who are giving aid to the countries. So this, this huge amount of perilous paperwork. And some of these ministries of health in, in African countries are completely overwhelmed. And Tanzania at one point basically said, for one month, don't come to our ministry. They put a moratorium on the representatives of the development agencies even coming to their offices. Just let us catch up with the paperwork. So th that's one problem. The other one is more serious and it's a very interesting quote from the Minister of Health of Nigeria, who sat in Geneva earlier this year. When I asked for a briefing on malaria, I was given a briefing by funding streams. I asked myself, is WHO dealing with a different strain of malaria to the global fund? You know, and, and even those of us who are not scientists will see you know, the, 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 the problem that, that poses in terms of how the country is going to deal with, with all this funding that's coming in. This one is even more disturbing, and I, once again, this is uh, from a, a paper in Lancet which looks at alignment. This graph here tells you what Cambodia wants, what the country wants. They want about 60% of health aid to be spent on primary health care and to scale up <coughs> equity funds to, to make health care more accessible. They want 60%. That's where they think the needs are. What are they getting? They're getting 60% for HIV AIDS and TB and malaria. They're not getting what they want, end of the story. So this is basically the lack of alignment. This is the lack of voice from the country in influencing how the deci these decisions are being made. I urge you to, to read that paper. It's, it's, it's quite dramatic, and that's just one slide that, that, that I used to illustrate. Um, there has been some attempts recently to see, okay, are there synergies between health systems okay, in countries and all these global health initiatives? Uh, the initial assessment is as follows. There have been some positive effects, like for example, an increased accuracy of TB diagnosis and higher vaccination rate. But the negative impacts are probably more important, and that is disruption of basic health services. And some countries, because they get more money from outside, they start cutting their own spending. I won't mention the countries, but there's one country who took 20% away from health, okay, and gave it to guess where? Anybody who wants to guess? <laughs> Defense, absolutely right. <laughs> so to summarize this part of, of, of the presentation, we are seeing in the current sort of scenario multiple diverse players, fragmentation, lack of coordination. Everybody has their own agenda. It's top-down, it's donor-driven, it has a negative impact on countries with, with fragile health systems. Plenty of money, but imbalance in terms of allocation to big diseases. People are looking for quick results, okay? Short-term projects, in three years I can show that reduction in incidence of malaria. In three years I can show better uptake of antiretroviral therapy, and much less on the more important horizontal <laughs> strengthening 
of the system as a whole. Okay, and that's a, a, a real problem. And as I've already said, a lack of evaluation and accountability, and then you then have to question uh, sustainability. Um, I think it might also be useful for me to maybe describe a little bit in this scenario who are sort of the main players and the various models that are being implemented. And I think in the, for the class later, I think you're particularly interested in the tools of global health governance. And let me just illustrate uh, with some examples. I think the major players are quite clear. This, this, this list is no surprise to, to, to anyone, you know, from international organizations to multilaterals to bilaterals and to the more uh, recent players all the way to civil societies and, and philanthropies. In terms of models and mechanisms, you've got market-driven private public partnerships which focus on delivery of global public goods such as you know, drugs and vaccines. You've got people who focus on promoting innovation systems to accelerate the, the development of needed re, uh, invent, interventions. Uh, Sanjeev Kagram talks about global action networks, which I don't really have time to go into. Uh, transgovernmental and multi-partner platforms, and I'll elaborate on one example of this, which is, I think, a very important current uh, platform. Uh, global Agenda Councils, the World Economic Forum, uh, has all these councils that try to, to determine uh, what are the critical issues that governance needs to deal with. There is, in Europe, a European Council on Global Health. Um, there has been some discussion about the need for a more legal approach, like a framework convention on global health. And many years ago, there was even a suggestion for yet another new organization which cuts across, which is intersectoral, called a world development organization. So these are just sort of the various uh, models that exist. And in terms of a legal approach, uh, Larry Gostin has been particularly uh, interested in developing these areas, and that's something we hope to discuss in the class later. And I'll illustrate to you that the legal approach is um, somewhat like the flavor of the month, whether it's the flavor of the future, we'll, we'll have to see. But definitely increasing interest in a more sort of legal uh, approach to, to governance. Uh, and this shows you essentially uh, in the context of WHO uh, that there has been a significant increase in the use of harder instruments in recent years, if you look at this. And this tells you the sort of the range of instruments or tools that WHO uses in order to influence health policy in countries, okay? It ranges from commissions, for example, you may have remembered that Jeff Sachs led a WHO commission on macroeconomics and health. That's just one example. And then we have a whole range of instruments all the way from regulations, conventions, agreements, and even sort of recommendations and guidelines negotiated in WHO and various strategies discussed at the World Health Assembly. So there is an increasing trend towards uh, these harder instruments over the years. And these are just two examples uh, of those instruments. Everyone knows the international health regulations because of the increase in, 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 in H1N1. Um, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is an internationally binding legal treaty that commits countries to limit uh, tobacco use. Uh, and uh, these two instruments are in a sense morally binding on the countries to, to, to abide by. Um, at the level of, of, of you know, high level politics, the G8 uh, in, in, in Japan last year, last year were very keen or had uh, the strengthening of health systems on its agenda. So I think there's no doubt that health is very visible politically. Uh, the G8 meeting this year, once again in, in, in uh, the one in Italy, had strong emphasis on health. It even issued a report on global health governance and multi-level policy coherence, and basically asking the question, can the G8 actually play an important role in global health governance in the future? That maybe we can get into in, in the class discussion later. Uh, I don't believe it can, but uh, let, let's, let's, let's look at, at the pros and cons of that. And just to, to, I want to tell you a little bit about WHO, because you know, not, not to sort of self-promote the organization, but I think in a way, as the major international public health agency, there is, I think, quite a major role for us to play in the future. 
whether that role should change is something that, that perhaps we can pick up during the question session. 60 years old, plenty of history, but also I think plenty of challenges in the future. Now, this happened before H1N1, and many of you know that after avian flu, when people were interested in developing vaccine, my home country, I come from Indonesia, decided they're not gonna send virus strains to WHO because they felt WHO were in bed with the pharmaceutical industry. These vaccines will, will be developed and then sold back to poor countries at prices they can't afford. So there was a, a real problem there in terms of, if you like, the credibility of the organization. And then of course, H1N1 come, comes along and Laurie Garrett actually says, I think many of you know Laurie Garrett, health journalist, very famous one. She considers that actually H1N1 is actually the ultimate test for global health governance. So this essentially puts WHO in a, a very sort of important pivotal role in trying to sort of negotiate a situation where everyone is treated fairly. And, you know, I want to share some things that in a sense, well, call it washing dirty laundry, but I don't think there's anyone else from WHO in this room, so. Um, we have some problems, okay? Um, <laughs> many. Um, there's always a tension between the, the clinical biomedical approach and the social med medical social determinants of health, poverty, equity. There's always that tension within the organization. This I already mentioned, vertical versus horizontal. Inadequate resources, and I'll elaborate on this in a minute. Unclear priorities, you know, we suffer from lack of coordination even within the organization. Weak leaderships, accusations of waste and corruption. In terms of external factors, and I think in, in terms of international relations generally, the declining commitment to multilateral action and the United Nations after the end of the Cold War. Um, the primacy of the World Bank, they have huge amounts of money to spend on health. Uh, political pressure exerted by powerful member states, okay? That's a reality in WHO. And an uh, anecdote I'll share with you. During the Bush administration, any program in WHO that has the word abortion on it just doesn't get through, okay? It will just get vetoed. And we are told, just take that word out. Anything to do with birth control or abortion, just take it out because otherwise, the Americans are just gonna veto any strategy that you put in that area. So powerful member states can influence the policies. I mean, that's the reality. Growing calls for social justice amidst globalization, that's what I've already mentioned. At the same time, this is our big issue right now. If you look in 19, the late 90s, about half of our budget comes from the contributions of the member states. The way WHO runs, is that every member state, and we have 193 member states, pays a contribution based on GDP per capita and population. The US is the biggest contributor. 22% of our budget comes from the United States. The next biggest contributor is Japan with 18%. So in the late 90s, our budget is about 50% from that. Now, it's about 25, maximum 30%. The rest comes from external sources or sources. To all intents and purposes, we are a soft money organization, okay? Sure, you see an increase in the budget, but it's, it comes with strings. Rotary will give us $250 million, but they'll tell us you can only spend it on polio, all right? So this is a real problem for WHO, you know, and I think a real challenge for the Director General to say you can't have an organization which has its policies dictated by vested interests, okay? Better not say any more. <laughs> At the same time, I'm very passionate. Otherwise, I would not have joined this organization because I believe it's the, the organization that can do a lot, especially for the low and middle income countries. We set standards, okay? Development of vaccines, those standards are set by us. We have an essential medicines list that all countries in the world adapt. International health regulations, that is a set of, of normative standards about how to deal with pandemics. Importantly, we have direct reach into ministries of health. We have 
a reputation for independence, impartiality, acting as a neutral broker and a convener and coordinator. Importantly, we have political legitimacy because 193 member states are our owners. We have a global reach. We have six regional offices in all the continents, and we have about 120 country offices, mostly in low- and middle-income countries. And I think, as I said, it gives a voice to and champions the health of, of, of poor people. It's a question of really whether we can, we can adapt to the changing times. Laurie Garrett said in her article in Foreign Affairs that the only organization with the political credibility to compel corporate thinking is the WHO. And Richard Horton also said that the need for a strong, well-funded, and politically supported WHO has become a much sharper and convincing argument today than for many years, once again in the context of all these emerging health threats that I just mentioned. Interestingly, at the highest level of the US government, which as I've already explained to you, very influential, this report from the Institute of Medicine, which as you, all of you know, very influential, said that the US government should support WHO as a leader in global health by paying its fair share of the organization's budget. We're trying to get them to increase that. It's been zero sum growth and providing technical expertise. But at the same time, it should also request an external review. And I think that's thoroughly uh, justified. And I hope this will happen. OK, let me just, in the last five, 10 minutes, finish off with, with what now? I mean, you know, what, what are some of the more recent developments and some of my personal thoughts about, about the future? And this sort of sets the scene for the class discussion that we're going to have. G20, OK, this just happened a couple of months ago. I think the question that's on everyone's minds here is that will the G20 replace the G8? And I'm particularly proud that Indonesia is now a member of, of, of the G20. Um, it probably likely will be. But in a sense, maybe more you know, in, in the political diplomacy, international relations, and maybe to some extent in the economic arena. In the health arena, I'm not so convinced because at the end of the day, the G8 or the G20 is not an entity that has a technical secretariat to support it. You know, it's, it's a political summit, uh, but it clearly has a lot of influence on, 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 on the big powers in the world. So if they continue uh, to, to, to give health an emphasis, I still think it has a role. There's no shortage of interest at the highest level. This is going to happen, uh, when is it? Two days' time, okay? The Europeans are really getting into the act. Merkel and Sarkozy are convening a World Health Summit. Once again, to say, well, in a way, it's sort of a, a Eurocentric interest here. What can Europe's contribution be in terms of dealing with global health problems? I've just taken a very superficial look at the website, but it looks very much that this is really pushing the, the technology side of, of European industry related to to drugs, devices, and, and diagnostics. So I think the, the public health focus in poor countries is probably a little lower on the agenda, but I stand corrected. Um, this is the one that I mentioned, okay? This is something called the International Health Partnership. This is convened by WHO, and once again, this is our role to be a neutral convener. And, and the idea here is exactly to bring together all these multiple players that uh, I mentioned earlier on. And one of the key activities that it's uh, been uh, focusing on is to convene a high-level task force on innovative international financing with a focus on health systems, which I mentioned is really the core of the problem. If you like, it's the elephant in the room. And the idea is to sort of have the development partners, you know, all these global health initiatives, actually work very closely with the country and set up these uh, country compacts so that, without going to all the details here, that the development partners essentially support one single one costed, results-oriented national health plan and budget. So it's not that they decide, but the country decides. They have a plan which is peer-reviewed, developed according to all these other criteria, which I'm not going to. But the development partners channel their, their aid directly through this country compact. 
Now, clearly, this is sort of the ideal, okay? And so far, I think about six or seven countries have signed up to develop this, this country compacts. And then eventually improving effective coverage and hopefully uh, improving the outcomes of those M MDG goals. So that's sort of uh, 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 the con concept, sort of also working with existing country mechanisms. Um, and in terms of, of, of this, the work of this task force, um, it, it met uh, just a month ago uh, in the context of a special event during the UN General Assembly, which was hosted by Gordon Brown and Robert Zolik, the president of the World Bank, which committed to raise uh, 3.5 billion in additional resources, especially for the health of women and children. And remember, these are the two MDG goals. So plenty of high-level uh, commitment. They met earlier in, 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 in Paris, once again, to come up with a set of recommendations. And let me just highlight a couple of these recommendations, uh, highlighting the word innovative, because there are some really nice ideas here, which I believe have potential. This is a great one, okay? This was spearheaded by the French and has about seven or eight countries buying to it. And the idea here is, as you know now, when you buy air tickets, many of it is done through the internet. There are these big, you know, uh, global travel agencies. What the French has been doing for the last two or three years is when you about to pay for it, right on the bottom line, they say, would you like to contribute one euro for a global health fund? Okay, just yes or no. If you're booking a business class ticket, the request is for 10 euros, okay? <laughs> just through that in the last two years, they've raised $650 million, okay? And it is being used not for research, it is being used to improve access to medicines. So that's a pretty neat idea. And it's sort of like a global solidarity movement. And there's talk, for example, of using the same approach to tax currency trading. Can you imagine the potential there? You know, people who really, you know, I, I know some of my friends who spend whole days just trading foreign exchange on the internet. Now, if you tax every transaction just one cent, you can imagine how potential that would be. So, so there's some really neat ideas about, about in, the, in, the, in, in, in this sort of mode. Um, this is another interesting area where it's called the International Financing Initiative, which support the Global Alliance for, for Vaccines. And essentially, uh, uh, the World Bank is, is behind this uh, to raise funds so that uh, Gavi uh, can expand immunization programs in, in, in developing countries. That's another one of these uh, initiatives. Advanced market commitments. This is where a group of donors uh, from different sources, including national governments, guarantee a price to a vaccine manufacturer to essentially entice them to actually do the development. Because for many of these vaccines, the drug companies don't want to develop it because they know there's no profit. You know, it's for people who can't afford to pay. So the advanced market commitment says, if you do the R&D, we'll guarantee you a price. That at least gives you a, a sort of a, um, a return, at least on your, on your initial investment. Debt to health. This is another interesting uh, initiative, uh, which is linked to the global fund in this case. And one example, the Australian government has signed up to debt to health. And it's a very simple concept. The government of Australia will fulfill its election commitment for a debt to health swap with Indonesia through this budget, the Australian budget. And basically, Australia will cancel debt owed by Indonesia in parallel with the government of Indonesia investing in programs combating tuberculosis. Okay, it's a pretty simple concept, swapping debt for health. And there's some other interesting ideas, more in the academic side, okay? Like people are saying that the Global Fund and Gavi should expand its remit beyond just vaccines, HIV, AIDS, and TB and malaria, but to include all of the health MDGs. You know, super global fund, that's one idea. And this one is interesting. It gets to this um, vertical versus horizontal. People are talking about diagonal financing, which cuts across, okay, uh, disease-specific results by improving health systems. So, you know, a lot of... of thinking in, in this whole field. So, finally, I, I said I'll speak no more than 40 minutes, two more minutes. 
Uh, some thoughts uh, uh, for the future. My own thoughts on, on, on the future of, of, of global health governance. Uh, I think it, it's really a series of, of balancing acts. You know, we've talked a lot about global governance, but I firmly believe that unless you have good, good national governance, you know, you're whistling in the wind. That's really the foundation. So you've got to balance that. You've got to have balance of both. Um, I think there has to be a mix of fairly formal as well as informal mechanisms. Don't underestimate the importance of, of civil society, for, uh, for example. Has to be a balance between market forces, you know. At the end of the day, pharmaceutical companies have to answer to the shareholders, and you can't say to them, you know, you, you've got to change that. But also balancing it with access, social justice, and equity. Um, this balance that we've already talked about, specific diseases and systems, a balance between being inclusive, being legitimate, being democratic, having every, everybody participate, or being effective. You know, that's clearly another balance uh, in terms of uh, how fast you, uh, you want to move forward. Do you try to get everybody on board, or do you just catch the major players? Um, ideas and theories versus implementation. There huge literature on various models of global health governance, but very little on implementation and evaluating the implementation. You know, actually really the need to make it work. Uh, learning from past successes and, and the need for innovation on future governance. So if you want seven effective habits, <laughs> what's the guy's name? Covey, right? Covey. Stephen Covey, okay. I read that a, a long time ago. Um, I think it has to be transsectoral, integrated view. It has to be inclusive, but at the same time, embracing diversity. Make sure that all the voices are heard. Uh, very clear definition of roles with, I think, very importantly, a shared agreement on what are the values and the norms. You know, I think there is still some sort of need for rules of the game. You know, you, you, you can't have anarchy, in other words. Um, accountability and, and transparency, I think that's very, very important. Uh, it has to be based on, on information and, and evidence. I think harnessing the power of information communication technology. I think you need aid. It's just a wonderful example of that. Uh, promoting research on governance, which the ST Lee project is, is, is doing, uh, perhaps towards an, an area that maybe one day will develop called evidence-informed governance, who knows. Uh, the balancing act that I mentioned to you. And finally, although I believe uh, the how is important, okay, the, the tools that, that we've mentioned, you know, the institutions, the players, the models, the mechanisms, sure, that's important, but I think we should also need not neglect the why. Why is it important? And I want to quote three people who were at the meeting last December who really got to the issue of the why. Inge Kohl, well known to many of you, said, focus on the problem, not on the architecture, okay? Or on the structures or sacred notion of sovereignty, okay? So it's getting away from the state cent centricity and more towards global solidarity but focusing on the problem and the task. Global governance must be purpose-driven, stroke Talbot, who's head of Brookings, I believe, president of Brookings. And finally, Sanjay, Sanjeev Kagram, who I thought hit the nail on the head when he said global governance is actually global uh, problem solving. So I think, you know, to, to finish off, I think uh, global health governance, you know, these drivers, they, they've got a really tough job of, of making sure these horses, you know, pull the cart towards the destination, and in, in a sense, what is that destination? And, and to me, there's no better uh, articulation of that destination than the, the core mission of, of, of the World Health Organization, which is really the attainment by all peoples of the highest possible level of health. So thank you very much. Diki, thank you very much. That was, as always, fascinating and thorough. Um, one quick logistical matter before I ask you to join me in thanking Tiki is, for those of you in the international relations class, as you saw in the email that went out on Friday that with the change of schedule, we are going to convene the class immediately following this seminar, so please move to the classroom after this point. Um, and with that, thank you very much to Tiki for an absolutely fascinating presentation.